Early last fall, I read most of the Supreme Court cases that selectively incorporated the liberties listed in Amendments 1 through 8 of the Bill of Rights through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Today, almost every liberty listed in those amendments has been incorporated to the states, except for a few having to do with juries, like the Seventh Amendment's right to a jury trial in civil cases and the Fifth Amendment right to indictment by a grand jury. But one of the more recent Bill of Rights liberties to be incorporated to the states was the Second Amendment in the 2010 case McDonald v. City of Chicago, a case that specifically asked the courts to incorporate the Second Amendment to the states through the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause, which is not usually the way incorporation has been done in the past. Typically, the court will decide a case in which the constitutional question presented is related to a particular Bill of Rights liberty, but doesn't necessarily come right out and ask the court to selectively incorporate it to the states. But not in this case. In this case, the court was directly asked to incorporate the Second Amendment to the states. An easy ask coming on the heels of their landmark decision in District of California v. Heller. And now, the 2010 opinion of the court in McDonald v. City of Chicago. Justice Alito announced the judgment of the court and delivered the opinion of the court with respect to Parts 1, 2A, 2B, 2D, 3A, and 3B, in which the Chief Justice, Justice Scalia, Justice Kennedy, and Justice Thomas join, and an opinion with respect to Parts 2C, 4, and 5, in which the Chief Justice, Justice Scalia, and Justice Kennedy join. Part 1 Otis MacDonald, Adam Orloff, Colleen Lawson, and David Lawson are Chicago residents who would like to keep handguns in their homes for self-defense, but are prohibited from doing so by Chicago's firearms laws. A city ordinance provides that no person shall possess any firearm unless such person is the holder of a valid registration certificate for such firearm. The code then prohibits registration of most handguns, thus effectively banning handgun possession by almost all private citizens who reside in the city. Like Chicago, Oak Park makes it unlawful for any persons to possess any firearm, a term that includes pistols, revolvers, guns, and small arms, commonly known as handguns. Chicago enacted its handgun ban to protect its residents from the loss of property and injury or death from firearms. The Chicago petitioners and their amici, however, argue that the handgun ban has left them vulnerable to criminals. Chicago Police Department statistics, we are told, reveal that the city's handgun murder rate has actually increased since the ban was enacted, and that Chicago residents now face one of the highest murder rates in the country, and rates of other violent crimes that exceed the average in comparable cities. Several of the Chicago petitioners have been the targets of threats and violence. For instance, Otis McDonald, who is in his late 70s, lives in a high-crime neighborhood. He is a community activist involved with alternative policing strategies, and his efforts to improve his neighborhood have subjected him to violent threats from drug dealers. Colleen Lawson is a Chicago resident whose home has been targeted by burglars. In Mrs. Lawson's judgment, possessing a handgun in Chicago would decrease her chances of suffering serious injury or death should she ever be threatened again in her home. McDonald, Lawson, and the other Chicago petitioners own handguns that they store outside of the city limits. 
but they would like to keep their handguns in their homes for protection. After our decision in Heller, the Chicago petitioners and two groups filed suit against the city in the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. They sought a declaration that the handgun ban and several related Chicago ordinances violate the Second and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution. Another action challenging the Oak Park Law was filed in the same district court by the National Rifle Association, NRA, and two Oak Park residents. In addition, the NRA and others filed a third action challenging the Chicago ordinances. All three cases were assigned to the same district judge. The district court rejected plaintiff's argument that the Chicago and Oak Park laws are unconstitutional. The court noted that the Seventh Circuit had squarely upheld the constitutionality of a ban on handguns a quarter century ago, and that Heller had explicitly refrained from opining on the subject of incorporation of the Second Amendment. The court observed that a district judge has a duty to follow established precedent in the Court of Appeals to which he or she is beholden, even though the logic of more recent case law may point in a different direction. The Seventh Circuit affirmed, relying on three 19th century cases, United States v. Cruikshank, 1876, Presser v. Illinois, 1886, and Miller v. Texas, 1894, that were decided in the wake of this court's interpretation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment in the Slaughterhouse Cases, 1873. The Seventh Circuit described the rationale of those cases as defunct and recognized that they did not consider the question whether the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause incorporates the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Nevertheless, the Seventh Circuit observed that it was obligated to follow Supreme Court precedents that have direct application, and it declined to predict how the Second Amendment would fare under this Court's modern selective incorporation approach. We granted certiorari. Part 2. Section A. Petitioners argue that the Chicago and Oak Park laws violate the right to keep and bear arms for two reasons. Petitioners' primary submission is that this right is among the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and that the narrow interpretation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause adopted in the Slaughterhouse Cases should now be rejected. As a secondary argument, petitioners contend that the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause incorporates the Second Amendment right. Chicago and Oak Park maintain that a right set out in the Bill of Rights applies to the states only if that right is an indispensable attribute of any civilized legal system. If it is possible to imagine a civilized country that does not recognize the right, the municipal respondents tell us, then that right is not protected by due process. And since there are civilized countries that ban or strictly regulate the private possession of handguns, the municipal respondents maintain that due process does not preclude such measures. In light of the party's far-reaching arguments, we begin by recounting this court's analysis over the years, of the relationship between the provisions of the Bill of Rights and the states. Section B. The Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, originally applied only to the federal government. In Barron v. Baltimore, 1833, the court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Marshall, explained that this question was of great importance, but not of much difficulty. In less than four pages, the court firmly rejected the proposition that the first eight amendments operate as limitations on the states, holding that they apply only to the federal government. 
the constitutional amendments adopted in the aftermath of the Civil War fundamentally altered our country's federal system. The provision at issue in this case, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, provides, among other things, that a state may not abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States or deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Four years after the adoption of the 14th Amendment, this court was asked to interpret the amendment's reference to the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. The slaughterhouse cases involved challenges to a Louisiana law permitting the creation of a state-sanctioned monopoly on the butchering of animals within the city of New Orleans. Justice Samuel Miller's opinion for the court concluded that the Privileges or Immunities Clause protects only those rights which owe their existence to the federal government, its national character, its constitution, or its laws. The court held that other fundamental rights, rights that predated the creation of the federal government and that the state governments were created to establish and secure, were not protected by the clause. In drawing a sharp distinction between the rights of federal and state citizenship, the court relied on two principal arguments. First, the court emphasized that the 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause spoke of the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and the court contrasted this phrasing with the wording in the first sentence of the 14th Amendment and in the Privileges and Immunities Clause of Article 4, both of which refer to state citizenship. Second, the court stated that a contrary reading would radically change the whole theory of the relations of the state and federal governments to each other, and of both these governments to the people. And the court refused to conclude that such a change had been made in the absence of language which expresses such a purpose too clearly to admit of doubt. Finding the phrase, privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, lacking by this high standard, the court reasoned that the phrase must mean something more limited. Under the court's narrow rating, the Privileges or Immunities Clause protects such things as the right to come to the seat of government to assert any claim a citizen may have upon that government, to transact any business he may have with it, to seek its protection, to share its offices, to engage in administering its functions, and to become a citizen of any state of the Union by a bona fide residence therein, with the same rights as other citizens of that state. Finding no constitutional protection against state intrusion of the kind envisioned by the Louisiana statute, the court upheld the statute. Four justices dissented. Justice Field, joined by Chief Justice Chase and Justices Swain and Bradley, criticized the majority for reducing the 14th Amendment's Privileges or Immunities Clause to a vain and idle enactment, which accomplished nothing and most unnecessarily excited Congress and the people on its passage. Justice Field opined that the Privileges or Immunities Clause protects rights that are, in their nature, fundamental, including the right of every man to pursue his profession without the imposition of unequal or discriminatory restrictions. Justice Bradley's dissent observed that we are not bound to resort to implication to find an authoritative declaration of some of the most important privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. It is in the Constitution itself. Justice Bradley would have construed the Privileges or Immunities Clause to include those rights enumerated in the Constitution, as well as some unenumerated rights. Justice Swain described the majority's narrow reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause as turning what was meant for bread into a stone. <laughs> 
Today, many legal scholars dispute the correctness of the narrow slaughterhouse interpretation. Three years after the decision in the slaughterhouse cases, the court decided Cruikshank, the first of the three 19th century cases on which the Seventh Circuit relied. In that case, the court reviewed convictions stemming from the infamous Colfax Massacre in Louisiana on Easter Sunday, 1873, Dozens of blacks, many unarmed, were slaughtered by a rival band of armed white men. Crookshank himself allegedly marched unarmed African-American prisoners through the streets and then had them summarily executed. Ninety-seven men were indicted for participating in the massacre, but only nine went to trial. Six of the nine were acquitted of all charges, the remaining three were acquitted of murder, but convicted under the Enforcement Act of 1870 for banding and conspiring together to deprive their victims of various constitutional rights, including the right to bear arms. The court reversed all of the convictions, including those relating to the deprivation of the victim's right to bear arms. The court wrote that the right of bearing arms for a lawful purpose is not a right granted by the Constitution and is not in any manner dependent upon that instrument for its existence. The Second Amendment, the court continued, declares that it shall not be infringed, but this means no more than it shall not be infringed by Congress. Our later decisions in Presser v. Illinois, 1886, and Miller v. Texas, 1894, reaffirmed that the Second Amendment applies only to the federal government. Section C. As previously noted, the Seventh Circuit concluded that Crookshank, Presser, and Miller doomed petitioners' claims at the Court of Appeals level. Petitioners argue, however, that we should overrule those decisions and hold that the right to keep and bear arms is one of the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. In petitioner's view, the Privileges or Immunities Clause protects all of the rights set out in the Bill of Rights, as well as some others. But petitioners are unable to identify the clause's full scope. Nor is there any consensus on that question among the scholars who agree that the slaughterhouse case's interpretation is flawed. We see no need to reconsider that interpretation here. For many decades, the question of the rights protected by the 14th Amendment against state infringement has been analyzed under the Due Process Clause of that amendment and not under the Privileges or Immunities Clause. We therefore decline to disturb the slaughterhouse holding. At the same time, however, this court's decisions in Crookshank, Presser, and Miller do not preclude us from considering whether the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment makes the Second Amendment right binding on the states. None of those cases engaged in the sort of 14th Amendment inquiry required by our later cases. As explained more fully below, Crookshank, Presser, and Miller all preceded the era in which the court began the process of selective incorporation under the Due Process Clause, and we have never previously addressed the question whether the right to keep and bear arms applies to the states under that theory. Indeed, Crookshank has not prevented us from holding that other rights that were at issue in that case are binding on the states through the Due Process Clause. In Crookshank, the court held that the general right of the people peaceably to assemble for lawful purposes, which is protected by the First Amendment, applied only against the federal government and not against the states. Nonetheless, over 60 years later, the court held that the right of peaceful assembly was a fundamental right safeguarded by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. We follow the same path here, and thus consider whether the right to keep and bear arms applies to the states under the Due Process Clause. Section D. 1. In the late 19th century, 
the court began to consider whether the due process clause prohibits the states from infringing rights set out in the Bill of Rights. Five features of the approach taken during the ensuing era should be noted. First, the court viewed the due process question as entirely separate from the question whether a right was a privilege or immunity of national citizenship. Second, the court explained that the only rights protected against state infringement by the due process clause were those rights of such a nature that they are included in the conception of due process of law. While it was possible that some of the personal rights safeguarded by the first eight amendments against national action might also be safeguarded against state action, the court stated, this was not because those rights are enumerated in the first eight amendments. The court used different formulations in describing the boundaries of due process. For example, in Twining, the court referred to immutable principles of justice, which inhere in the very idea of free government, which no member of the Union may disregard. In Snyder v. Massachusetts, 1934, the court spoke of rights that are so rooted in the traditions and conscience of our people as to be ranked as fundamental. And in Palco, the court famously said that due process protects those rights that are the very essence of a scheme of ordered liberty and essential to a fair and enlightened system of justice. Third, in some cases decided during this era, the court can be seen as having asked, when inquiring into whether some particular procedural safeguard was required of a state, if a civilized system could be imagined that would not accord the particular protection. Thus, in holding that due process prohibits a state from taking private property without just compensation, the court described the right as a principle of natural equity, recognized by all temperate and civilized governments, from a deep and universal sense of its justice. Similarly, the court found that due process did not provide a right against compelled incrimination, in part because this right has no place in the jurisprudence of civilized and free countries, outside the domain of the common law. Fourth, the court during this era was not hesitant to hold that a right set out in the Bill of Rights failed to meet the test for inclusion within the protection of the Due Process Clause. The court found that some such rights qualified, but others did not. Finally, even when a right set out in the Bill of Rights was held to fall within the conception of due process, the protection or remedies afforded against state infringement sometimes differed from the protection or remedies provided against abridgment by the federal government. To give one example, in Betts, the court held that although the Sixth Amendment required the appointment of counsel in all federal criminal cases in which the defendant was unable to retain an attorney, the Due Process Clause required appointment of counsel in state criminal proceedings only where want of counsel in the particular case resulted in a conviction lacking in fundamental fairness. Similarly, in Wolf v. Colorado, 1949, the court held that the core of the Fourth Amendment was implicit in the concept of ordered liberty and thus enforceable against the state's through the Due Process Clause, but that the exclusionary rule which applied in federal cases did not apply to the states. 2. An alternative theory regarding the relationship between the Bill of Rights and Section 1 of the 14th Amendment was championed by Justice Black. This theory held that Section 1 of the 14th Amendment totally incorporated all of the provisions of the Bill of Rights. As Justice Black noted, the chief congressional proponents of the 14th Amendment espoused the view that the amendment made the Bill of Rights applicable to the states and, in so doing, 
overruled this court's decision in Barron. Nonetheless, the court never has embraced Justice Black's total incorporation theory. 3. While Justice Black's theory was never adopted, the court eventually moved in that direction by initiating what has been called a process of selective incorporation, i.e. the court began to hold that the Due Process Clause fully incorporates particular rights contained in the first eight amendments. The decisions during this time abandoned three of the previously noted characteristics of the earlier period. The court made it clear that the governing standard is not whether any civilized system can be imagined that would not accord the particular protection. Instead, the court inquired whether a particular Bill of Rights guarantee is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty and system of justice. The court also shed any reluctance to hold that rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights met the requirements for protection under the Due Process Clause. The court eventually incorporated almost all of the provisions of the Bill of Rights. Only a handful of the Bill of Rights protections remain unincorporated. Finally, the court abandoned the notion that the 14th Amendment applies to the states only a watered-down, subjective version of the individual guarantees of the Bill of Rights, stating that it would be incongruous to apply different standards depending on whether the claim was asserted in a state or federal court. Instead, the court decisively held that incorporated Bill of Rights protections are all to be enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect those personal rights against federal encroachment. Employing this approach, the court overruled earlier decisions in which it had held that particular Bill of Rights guarantees, or remedies, did not apply to the states. We've finished the first half of this opinion, but don't worry, the next episode will pick up exactly where this episode ended. Until next episode, thanks for listening to what SCOTUS wrote us.